So firstly, I want to speak about aminoglycosides. Aminoglycosides are a very important uh, class of antibiotics. They have a narrow therapeutic index. They can have several adverse effects. So they are considered a high risk antibiotic, this particular class. So the first thing I want you to think about is can you think of any examples of aminoglycosides from the top of your head? And keep those in your mind. And then I want you to think about what are the particular side effects associated with aminoglycosides? And how will these side effects link into the cautions and contraindications? So take a moment to think about this prior to me moving on to the next slide. So let's go through aminoglycosides. There's five examples that I want you to remember. Amikacin, gentamicin, neomycin, streptomycin, and tobramycin. Some important, um, some important facts. So streptomycin was in fact um, the first antibiotic that was used for the treatment of tuberculosis. It isn't used anymore. Uh, it was, this was within the region of the 1940s leading up to the 1950s. The reason why it's not used for anymore for this uh, indication, um, and you won't see it in a lot of the regimens, is because of resistance, as you would expect if it's used for such a long period of time. So streptomycin was used uh, for tuberculosis, but we don't use it anymore because of resistance. From the five examples that I've given you, which of these five do you think is the most commonly prescribed in the UK? And if you look at those, there's one that you will see that you'll be a lot more familiar with, um, and that's gentamicin, especially if you work within secondary care. So if you work in a hospital, you're more likely to see gentamicin being prescribed for patients. Gentamicin is uh, the most commonly prescribed in the UK. Uh, all of these aminoglycosides, the way they work is they're bactericidal. So this is the first time I'm introducing the term bactericidal to you. You should be more familiar with this uh, from your microbiology lessons as an undergraduate student. But if you aren't familiar with it, bactericidal simply means that it kills the bacteria. And bacteriostatic means that it inhibits the growth of the bacteria. The way in which it works, it binds two ribosomes and inhibits protein synthesis. And it's active against some gram-positive organisms, but the majority of its activity is against gram-negative organisms. The gram-positive organisms that is effective against include Staphylococcus aureus and methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, MRSA. The reason why it's active against Staphylococcus aureus and methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus is the way in which it works. It needs to use oxygen-dependent transport systems to make its way into bacteria. These are found on the surface of Staphylococcus aureus and MRSA and are not found on other gram-positive organisms and therefore it's only active against Staphylococcus aureus and MRSA. In terms of gram-negative activity, it's active against a wide array of different gram-negative bacteria. In particular, and one of the most important ones is Pseudomonas aeruginosa. It's active against Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which is a gram negative organism, it's highly drug resistant, can be, cause a lot of problems with regards uh, to patients being in hospital and can cause hospital acquired infections. In particular, it can cause hospital acquired pneumonia. In terms of indications for aminoglycosides, these include infective endocarditis. Sometimes they will be used alongside vancomycin for infective endocarditis. They can be used for septicemia or cases of septic shock. This is mainly because of its gram-negative bacteria and gram-negative organisms are largely associated with, with septic shock, particularly when they make their way into the blood. It can also be used for meningitis, although you may not see it as much, and can be used for pneumonia. But in particular, it's used for hospital acquired pneumonia. This falls back to what I just said with regards to its activity. It covers Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which is largely uh, can be largely responsible for cases of hospital acquired pneumonia. Side effects include impairment of neuromuscular transmission. This can be important when we start to link it to cautions and contraindications. 
um, it can cause irreversible ototoxicity. So any damage, uh, any ototoxic damage ir is irreversible and that's why it's crucial to counsel patients on things they should look out for. What are some of the things that you would advise a patient to look out for? The first thing is if they notice any hearing loss. Uh, secondly, if they notice any ringing in their ears or if they notice that they are dizzy or have any problems with their balance because that indicates to you that you're damaging, damaging vestibular function. Of course, within, um, within the ear canal, you have uh, you you have your vestibular function is essentially coordinated from within your ear canal. Uh, this is really falls down to uh, fluid within the cochlea. Um, it's a bit more complicated. And I don't want to go through it in too much detail, but essentially, any ototoxic damage can lead uh, to patients feeling dizzy. Uh, can lead to patients feeling dizzy. So dizziness hearing loss, ringing in the ears, tinnitus, are all the things that you should be counseling patients on and all the things that you should be looking out for. In terms of nephrotoxicity, it can cause nephrotoxicity, so kidney damage, but the nephrotoxicity is reversible, so that should be taken into account. It can cause antibiotic associated colitis. This is inflammation of the colon as a result of antibiotics. Mainly this is res the organism that's responsible for this is Clostridios difficile, C. difficile. Um, so the reason for this is a lot of antibiotics that you use will cover a lot of anaerobic or organisms, but not Clostridios difficile. And because it doesn't cover C. difficile, it allows C. difficile to overgrow. It allows C. difficile to have less competition and have access to more nutrients that would otherwise be taken up by other bac anaerobic bacteria within the gut because of this imbalance within the gut and the gut's flora which is the normal uh, organisms that are contained within the gut this less competition leads to C. difficile really having the time that it needs to overgrow and cause problems So it's, uh, it can also cause uh, peripheral neuropathy and it can cause electrolyte disturbances. One thing that should be noted is it's not absorbed well from the gut and this is why it's normally given parenterally. If you think about the fact that it's not absorbed well from the gut, that means it remains in the gut and that's where you use neomycin for bile ster sterilization. You utilize the fact that it's not absorbed well from the gut and therefore it will remain within the gut and it can sterilize uh, the bowel this is mainly prior to surgery. Uh, once daily regimens are normally preferred over multiple daily regimens, uh, cautions and contraindications associated with aminoglycosides include um, cautiously used in those with clinical muscle weakness, like myasthenia gravis. The reason for this, it can uh, impair neuromuscular transmission. There's also already impairment with neuromuscular transmission in myasthenia gravis. It will just make that worse. Uh, also, it should be avoided alongside ototoxic drugs like cisplatin and fruzamide as it can increase the risk of ototoxicity. It should generally be avoided in nephrotoxic drugs as well like vancomycin and cyclosporin. But there are some circumstances where you will see vancomycin and gentamicin prescribed together. Uh, mainly this is uh, because of their difference in their spectrum of activity. Uh, vancomycin is mainly gram positive, is only gram posi positive, sorry, in terms of its uh, spectrum of activity, and therefore uh, the gram negative coverage with amino glycosides and the gram positive coverage with vancomycin can be useful and synergistic in some indications. Some of these indications will be infective endocarditis, for example. Uh, it should be generally avoided with other nephrotoxic drugs like cyclosporin. Now, this is where the introduction of amino glycosides comes to an end. In the next video, I want to go through the monitoring requirements for amino glycosides.